Hey everybody, uh, Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody is having an unbelievable day uh, to this point, winding down, also winding down the week. Uh, look, I'm gonna say some things. Uh, I'm gonna try to be as succinct and as I possibly can. Uh, I know that I am a person that can be long-winded and that's just who I am. Uh, I try to be thorough in my writing, thorough in my talking, uh, because I don't want to leave any room for confusion. Uh, people who are hell-bent on being confused or mistaking what you say are gonna do it anyway, but I want people who really are trying to gain an understanding to be able to do just that and so with that being said with that being said uh, I expound more than the average person um, now first and foremost we are still pressing uh, for uh, the targeted fundraiser for the Black Men Lead. Obviously, the organization accepts fun, uh, funds for everything we do, but we are targeting uh, the Black Men Lead uh, Rite of Passage program for young boys and young uh, adult black males because there's such a great need for so many of the services that we provide through the program and there is a lack of resources and so we're pushing it and against my pride, which I'll admit I have at times, against my pride and against just the natural proclivity, the natural, I say, the natural resistance to ask for help. Again, pride. Um, I'm doing this because I'm not the only one that benefits from it. I'm not the only one that's invested in it. I'm not the only one that it matters to. Uh, you know, I have an aversion to asking people for help. Um, and, and, and especially for a number of different reasons. But here we are consistently coming back each day. And I still get told that I'm not really pushing it and that I'm not really hammering at home, that I'm not really selling it. I mean, I've, I've been doing what I've been doing for decades. I, I'm, I'm not new at this. I didn't just break out of the, the game two or three years ago. I've been, I was doing what I do now before that was a YouTube, before that was a Facebook, uh, before that was a Twitter. I, I've been doing this when the internet was an infant. I was doing it, and I was doing it before. Uh, but definitely, before everything became what it is now and everybody has a platform, I was doing it when there wasn't any clout to chase, when that was simply work to be done. I've been doing this. So um, I feel like the people who want to find out what I've done can do it. The people who want to see the work I've done. Hell, I've written 24 books, hundreds of articles. Matter of fact, I just got interviewed the other night, put that up, and somebody... Uh, made a post and I respect their position, but it goes to show exactly why what I do is so important. Uh, I did an interview with a brother that found me. He found something I published on incest, uh, rape and molestation in the black community. I posted it like six years ago. Uh, no, I didn't post it. I published it six years ago. It's actually published on a couple of online um journals, nothing major, but just something that I wanted to put out there. And he looked me up, literally found me and asked me uh, to do an interview. Comes to find out that his wife actually follows me. So that was interesting. But anyway, I did the interview and I posted the interview. And it's a busy thing the way he has his thing set up. So it's kind of difficult to, you know, to pay attention for some people. Uh, I, I always adapt and I adjust, so it wasn't a problem for me, but there was a lot going on in the background while the interview was going on, and you can see it uh, in the interview. But someone came on, and again, I respect their opinion. I don't think they were being a detractor or being negative. I think they were actually adding uh, some insight from where they were sitting, and they were saying that 
this type of conversation really doesn't benefit the issue, uh, which is childhood sexual abuse in the black community uh, in, 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 in whole. And they said that most people who are actually dealing with all of this right now won't even listen to an hour long conversation on the topic. Well, the, the, the conversation wasn't about just talking about it. It was about where it came from, uh, what is the force behind it, where it originated, but also why has it uh, been such a perpetual force in the black community for so long? And, uh, and and also, uh, which is a prerequisite for me to talk about anything is, how do we solve the problem, how we get to it? And we talked about that. But the person made their point that nobody's listening to our long conversation. Um, you know, he pointed to, you know, how things work on Instagram and Twitter and everything like that. And, you know, I responded to him, told him, I said, the point is, I'm not reaching out to the masses. If you have a problem and the problem is perpetual and uh, sustained within the masses and the behavior of the masses, you're not going to find your solution. In the masses, you're going to find your solution in the 1% that do not behave that way or the 1% who can sit up and watch or listen to a one hour long discussion on a topic and search that discussion for answers and find out how they can be a part of the solution. Those are the people I'm reaching out to. If, if I were looking for likes and subscribers, I would have more than 7,000 and, and some change subscribers. I would have more. Now I have on the previous channel, but still not nearly as much as a lot of other people have. And one of the reasons why I don't have a lot of subscribers is because 98% of my stuff is total substance. I don't do a lot of sensationalism. And when I do get on a trending topic, it's because there's a teaching moment in it. But I don't want to get too dr drug off into the cup, but that's just the thing that we deal with is that we can't get to a point of actually moving towards change, but we because we are catering to the what's the word I want we're catering to the systemic issues and problems that perpetuate the problem lack of attention sensationalism consumerism all of the individualism all the things that drive people that are going to make people click on stuff and share stuff and watch stuff aren't the things that's going to solve the problem and so that that's not the things that's going to solve the problem. The things that are going to solve the problem are the things that require work, require understanding, require consistency. Uh, it, it's boring to the average person. They don't want to deal with it because it's boring. It's monotonous. Uh, it doesn't have any immediate gratification. So they don't want to get into that. But that's where the win is. The win is not in what's immediately gratifying. It's, you know, the things that are immediately gratifying are short-lived. And if it's short-lived, it doesn't have longevity. If it doesn't have longevity, it definitely can't solve the problems we have. Because the problems we have are deep into the future. And we're going to have to work deep into um, the behavior of the people. And so he said, well, how do you get everybody to swing to it? You find the people who have the capacity to touch and I explained this in that conversation. I said, the way that we're going to change all of the things that ail us is not by going out and doing lectures. It, it, it's not by all the things we're doing. It, it, it's going to be by the things that we're doing, finding the right people. So I don't lecture for the masses. I lecture for the people who are serious about change. I lecture for the people who can see the value in what I do and want to be a part of it. I lecture for the people who can sit up and create the network through which you operate, but you're going to have to literally isolate an entire generation. You're going to have to find a generation that has not yet been contaminated with consumerism, that has not yet been contaminated with uh, individualism, that has not yet been contaminated with self-hatred and the identity crisis, a lack of a knowledge and an understanding of self, and all of the other things that are a part of the problem. Uh, from a sociological and a psychological level, you're going to have to find uh, a generation that hasn't been touched. So you're talking about people under the age of eight. 
Uh, we start with our young boys at the age of four. You start with them and then you are going to have to encapsulate them and isolate them at a level and protect them from on the outside. And don't tell me it can't be done because I have a friend and a person I call a sister uh, in the game. She run, owns a compound in, in, it, in, 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 in it, in the Apple, in Indianapolis, uh, Indiana. And on this compound, she teaches, uh, she shares, and she's reared her eight children on this compound. She homeschooled them. She taught them. And we were having a conversation one day with uh, her and uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Blanchard and myself, and that's how I first met her. I knew of her before then, but Dr. Blanchard is the one that actually introduced me to her because he's been knowing her since 1990. And he introduced me to her, and we were talking and having a conversation, and she mentioned that she can remember when her oldest daughter first saw a white person for the first time. That's how she kept them protected. She trained them and protected them. People say, well, how do you... You have to make some sacrifices, first of all. You can't sit up and have a yearning and a, a little addiction to the system and do that. You have to be willing to really disconnect from the system and do that. But the way that her kids move, the way that her kids operate, the way that her kids address their elders, the way that her kids move about, uh, she homeschooled her kids. Not only did she isolate them from white people, period, so I think they were like four or five, but she then turned around and created an environment where she taught them about how important they were, how capable they were, it taught them the importance of owning their own business. A lot of things we teach young black male, males in the Black Man Lead Rite of Passage program. And then, in order to graduate high school from her school, every last one of them had to start and run a business that their, the beginning from the uh, end of their junior year to the end of their senior year for an entire year they had to run a business they created on their own successfully and um, her youngest son who I've had the chance to actually communicate with, with by, you know and that was something that, that, that I, I mean like kid is unbelievable he's 21 years old and the way he moves and thinks and operates on a whole nother spectrum of And the thing is, what's different than him and the average 21 year old kid? Nothing except for the way he, he was reared, the way he was protected, the way he was covered, the value system that he was given and had it reinforced in him. Um, that's it. He was empowered. Uh, he wasn't given up to the system. He wasn't surrendered to the system. He wasn't uh, allowed to be reared by the system. He definitely wasn't allowed to be reared by social media. Matter of fact, her, none of her kids got phones until they reached their junior year. The only two were the twins, which this young boy is one of. Um, they got them, and the only reason they got them is they were moving out of the country. The younger kids, her and the younger kids were moving out of the country. I'm not telling anything that she wouldn't want me to tell. She actually did this, talked about this in the interview that we all did together for uh, the teachers. So I'm not sharing anything that she hasn't shared publicly. And she is open to teaching because she wants people to learn. Uh, that's why they have the compound. They literally invite people up there and show them how you can live off the grid, how you can do a bunch of things. But anyway, um, the only reason that the two twins got phones when they were 15 is because they were moving, uh, I want to think, to Barbados. No, one Barbados. It was, uh, uh, I'll think of it in a minute, but they were moving there. And she wanted them to have 100% access to their dad. Even though her and their dad aren't together anymore, uh, they are still close. They still co-parent, even though the kids are grown. But at that time, they weren't. And she's never, ever tried to stop it from being around. And matter of fact, she encourages it. And um, they have a very uh, good working relationship. Um, anyway, they didn't have those phones. Until, and then it was a flip phone but until they had to move. Um, and that is another thing that they did. I'm saying all of this because 
we act like we we act like we don't have a chance to do something about what we're dealing with and we do. The problem is nobody wants to man up or stand up or whatever you want to say uh, and actually take action and we are doing that. And you know, and people will, you know, what are you doing? Well, I've been doing it for a while. I literally get requests to work with black men, uh, normally from single moms, sometimes from parents, uh, sometimes the parents that are coming for stuff like uh, their child is being mishandled in school. Uh, the school is trying to put their child into an IEP, which will designate them as uh, you know, special needs learning and special education. And while it'll produce more money for the school, some in most instances, double of what the average student will produce for the school when it's state uh, government funded. Uh, it very rarely produces the same level of intensity and increase in intensity in uh, teaching that child. Uh, and again, you're talking about a system that even at its best isn't conducive to truly educating a ch child. As I have stated before that uh, true education is the empowerment and preparing of a child to go out into a world that's hostile towards them and not only compete but win. Dr. Amos Wilson said, education is the repairing of an individual to be able to solve their problems. And if you are, the, if, if, if the education that your children are getting doesn't allow them to effectively solve their problems, they aren't being educated, they're being indoctrinated, they're being uh, brainwashed, they are being miseducated and misled. And it's our responsibility to do something about it. It's never, Malcolm X said, only a fool expects his enemy to educate his children. And I think that's another part of the problem. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. So when I come to you and I say, hey, we need your support, this isn't about some... And uh, that was somebody that came on. I want to address this. Then I'll, I'll be done. Somebody came on on one of the... Uh, videos I've done on this in the within the last few days. I don't know which one and I don't want to point it out because I don't necessarily want everybody to go back to read this. But they pointed out something that I never do. And they weren't wrong. Uh, it's just something I choose not to do. They pointed out that we got behind a certain individual and gave them literally over a million dollars in a very short period of time for something they were working on and literally haven't heard anything about it. And while it would be something nice to look at, it would not be something that would be, quote unquote, a, an element or component in the community that could change the lives of individuals in the community. And they got that million in a relatively short period of time. Um, what you have noticed is, no, I've had some, uh, some significant uh, differences with some people who didn't handle me right, even when I did right by them and you've never known it because I'm not gonna put them on blast because I believe they're doing some work out there. And the conflict will just cause confusion and distraction. There are some others that I look at and go, man, what are they actually really doing? But everybody's hot on them. And I, but I'm never going to sit up and do, but this person pointed, pointed it out and talked about it. And Dr. Blanchard and I talk about this all the time, that the people who are actually boots on the ground, actually put in the work, hardly ever get the support. The people who are the loudest, the most entertaining, uh, the most charismatic, that say a lot of good stuff, but really have no depth of the ones that people get behind. That's a part of the problem. That's the same thing that the person who was telling me about that interview I did. That was what they were saying. Hey, you're not gonna get the attention of the people. And unfortunately that's true. I'm not gonna get the attention of the people. My goal isn't to get the attention of the masses. My goal is to get the attention of the people who get it people who want to be a difference makers and for us to start igniting a movement within ourselves of changing things and then letting the change of how we do things over time change the generations up to come there are some people that are so stuck in their ways beyond the age of 20 and 30 and definitely 40 and 50 and up that you're not going to reach them 
uh, in time to actually have any impact in the next 10 or 15 years. Your change is gonna come from the people who are younger, but they're not gonna listen to you in masses because they don't get it because the world isn't telling them. Nothing on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube is telling everybody, hey, focus on your learning, read your books, learn about your history. You, you see it posted here and there, and then you're called, uh, you know, it's gotten to the point where the word hotel is a bad word now. The word being awakened, the, the idea of being awakened or being awoke, of being woke is a bad word now. Why? Because so many people have dirtied it. So many people jumped out that, you know, they didn't know how to reach people. They were either very mean or condescending or they used it as a hustle or whatever it is. And now it's a bad word. And so nobody trusts anything. Everybody's just looking to be entertained. Everybody, see, being entertained is a form of escape, escapism. And so everybody wants to escape. Nobody wants to put in work. Nobody wants to be invested. And I get that. You know, uh, being a master addiction uh, counselor, which is one of the things that I'm qualified for, uh, I know a whole lot about escapism. I know a whole lot about how people do a bunch of things to get away from the realities that they face. Um, but nevertheless, we're gonna keep doing what we're doing. I did the work for years to develop Black Man League, the research, the understanding of how things work, the understanding of why there's such a, a high level of violence among uh, African-American adolescent and young adult Black males. Uh, I understand it. I also understand how to overcome it. I've had numerous discussions on the dynamics behind the violence. I've told us how we can overcome it. And I actually was sort of triggered for this video by uh, something that's happening more and more often here in Houston, where I'm from. <laughs> These random acts of violence where young black males are just running up on people. Like uh, yesterday, random uh, black male uh, looks, looks from the video, he's masked up, looks to be under 20 runs up on a 60 year old man they got some footage shoots him in the back and while he's dying he's going through his pockets while you will never eliminate all senseless violence a lot of this violence can be eliminated by understanding where it comes from understanding what precipitated it and eliminating that and that can be done I've talked about it endlessly it can be done but the work has to be put forth the energy the effort has been put forth um i'm gonna get ready to get off here but i would love to have your support um the manner in which you can support us uh will be in the description box there are a couple of different ways you can do it to make it easy on you it's in the description box but what i can tell you is we're not going to get anywhere if we don't start investing in our kids on that note i'm out of here